Cuervo y Sobrinos is a luxury brand that has an exclusive history. It has witnessed much of the Republic's history, including the two world wars. There had never been a jewelry store so famous. And despite not being the largest jewelry brand on the island, it was certainly the most important. It was a prestigious jewelry. Needless to say, authentic. Those people who intended to buy a watch would visit Cuervo y Sobrinos. A Swiss luxury watch brand born on the Caribbean island of Cuba. There are people who have the watches at home, cherished and no longer in use. They won't sell them for anything because they were in love with their prestigious watch. Cuervo y Sobrinos was the largest watch shop Havana had ever seen, or Cuba for that matter. Havana was a modern, contemporary and important city. It has been a cultural hub since the 19th century. The fact that these watches represent our history culturally speaking, makes us feel proud. No one talks about Cuervo y Sabrinos without thinking about Cuba. Cuervo y Sabrinos is part of Cuba's heritage. It is like family. Cuervo y Sobrinos is a Swiss luxury watch brand that was founded in Havana approximately 140 years ago. The watchmaking heritage of one of the most important Latin American jewelers continues today, making exclusive timepieces. It all began when a Spanish immigrant from Asturias named Ramon Fernandez Cuervo opened a jewelry store in Havana in the early 1860s. In 1882, Don Ramon was joined by two of his nephews, Teodomiro and Baldomero. Between them, they managed the company's wholesale jewelry business, working from a house on Teniente Ray Street. Later, two further nephews, Placido and Losardo, joined the company. The entrepreneurial brothers progressively arrived from Spain in order to work with their uncle. In 1885, the final brother arrived, Armando Fernandez Rio y Cuervo. Immigrants always travel to places where financial opportunities are on offer. At this time, many Asturians, Galicians, and Canarians migrated from Spain to Cuba because the island enjoyed a buoyant economy. The Asturian migration at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was quite significant. 90% of the commercial businesses established in Cuba during the 19th century can trace their origins to one country, namely Spain. The Cuervo y Sobrinos watch and jewelry store began began like many other businesses in Havana during this period. They were family businesses. Many immigrants came to Havana to try their luck, like in this case. Ultimately, they'd send for their relatives. It was typical of the Spanish who lived in Havana during this time. The nephew was an iconic figure in Cuba during this period, often referred to in novels and the theater, everywhere in fact, because the nephew is a young man going to work with immigrants that have already settled. The nephew would join the business, and then as the founder grew older, he would assume more responsibility, ensuring the continuity of the business. You will find many companies that are like Cuervo y Sobrinos. It was a way that many companies were organized at the time, a common business practice of the period. Later, Cuervo y Sobrinos opened two import offices for its purchases in Europe one in Forsheim, Germany, and the other on Mesley Street, Paris. Forsheim was known as the Golden City because it was the epicenter of the German jewelry industry, while Mesley Street is in the third arrondissement of Paris and is the home of various shops. Don Armando rises to prominence. The family business quickly flourishes, and headquarters relocate to Morala Street, an important commercial street in Old Havana. In the 19th century, clocks were luxury items that only people from the upper classes who could afford importing quality clocks could have in their homes. Most people didn't have watches at home and relied on public clocks in town or the chimes of public clocks. Ramon Fernandez Cuervo, the founder of Cuervo y Sobrinos, passed away in 1907. While grieving over their loss, his nephews took over the prosperous business and carried on the legacy of their uncle. The fat cow period didn't last for long. 
but saw great development, especially for the sugar industry. On top of that, it expanded to the entire country, like concentric circles. This allows for the middle and upper classes to start living, as if they were in richer countries. They built mansions that still stand to this day. They bought cars, expensive clothes, as well as jewelry, supplied by Cuervo y Sobrinos. All of this helped to bolster the company's growth. In the 20th century, new stores started popping up in San Rafael Street, a new urban corridor lined with modern shops. This location attracted Cuervo y Sobrinos. I'd say Cuervo y Sobrinos was the first luxury firm established with all the business functions gathered in one place. It managed direct distribution, shops, and the warehouse all by itself. Cuervo y Sobrinos didn't just move anywhere. It went to those areas that reinforced its prestigious image. Indeed, the fact that the company moved to a major commercial street resulted in people considering it as a part of the city's urban heritage. Up until this point, Cuervo y Sobrinos operated as a jewelry import warehouse. At the new headquarters, the company started producing its own jewelry and doing retail, selling directly to customers. At the shop, they only work with the precious stones, such as gems and emeralds. The rubies they would work on were nothing short of dazzling. It was the finest jewelry. Not just any jewelry. That was Cuervo y Sobrinos. So prosperity was not limited to the bourgeoisie. It was an extremely open society, where people were entering and leaving the island of Cuba. They were attracted to its modern market, with big, luxurious stores on the main commercial streets. Here, they would find anything they desired. And Cuervo y Sobrinos was part of all that. In 1925, Don Armando passed away, and his brother Placido became the head of the jewelry boutique. Placido brought a teenager from Spain to work for Cuervo y Sobrinos. His name was Ricardo Ravon Alonso, and he gradually gained influence within the company. Ricardo Ravon was already the CEO, and between 1938 and 1941, he was the chairman of the Association of Storekeepers of Galeano and San Rafael Streets. This demanding role granted special status as it encompassed working with renowned stores, such as El Encanto and Fin de Siglo. Large department stores emerged quite early in Cuba. They were first established in the 20s and enjoyed a period of growth, especially in the 40s. They became highly important as they gradually developed their trade. Large department stores stood at the top of the commercial elite. However, those stores with several branches were held in the highest esteem. And within the jewelry trade, Cuervo y Sobrinos was undoubtedly one of retailing's elite. The ultimate commercial store in San Rafael Street was Cuervo y Sobrinos. This wasn't by chance. It was the result of many years of hard work. Aficionados divide Cuervo y Sobrinos watches into three categories. The introductory, or entry range, includes the classic Cuervo y Sobrinos models. These watches were equipped with Swiss movements from Felsa, AS, ETA, and Landerin. Their sole inscription was Cuervo y Sobrinos Habana. Occupying the mid to high range, was Cuervo y Sobrinos tradition. The watches in this category had felsa and AS movements and featured simple complications. The dials were inscribed with Cuervo y Sobrinos Habana tradition, and they also were endowed with the jeweler's logo. The dual-branded Cuervo y Sobrinos watches were outstanding items within the firm's catalog. To begin with, these watches were customized and had dual branding and granted them a certain status and legitimacy. 
In the world of watchmaking, Bevo y Sobrinos enjoyed a prestigious image. However, the brand's reputation didn't arise solely from the sale of the company's high-end timepieces, but also the sale of its own pocket watches. These were affordable, yet exclusive products. The company embraced both types of watch and never prioritized one at the expense of the other. From a simple watch made to impart the time, for people with limited buying power, up to a jewelry watch for affluent clientele. Aside from the Roca, Cuervo y Sobrinos also distributed a very prestigious brand. But Tech Philip, who made notably expensive timepieces. It imported Rolex as well. This continued success led the company to become even better known and financially stronger. As a result, they began ordering and distributing more exclusive and expensive items. Watches were not made in Cuba, but in Switzerland. There were never watch factories in Cuba. Cuervo y Sobrinos has always manufactured or ordered its watches from Switzerland. This is important to know because, for obvious reasons, the watches couldn't be made in Cuba. Cuba does not have the Swiss tradition and watchmaking know-how. They were the best watchmakers and had a rich tradition of making watches going back centuries. At the time, there was no country with this experience and offering comparable quality. I believe they imported all the watches that existed in the world and brought them to Cuba. If not all, at least 90 or 80 percent of all Swiss watch brands are present in Cuba. The Cuervo y Sobrinos jewels were, needless to say, authentic. The most ordinary metal used here was the 18 karat gold. Everything else was platinum, a metal vastly superior to gold. They used precious stone from the first world. So we are talking about jewels of a very high technical level and with high production costs. That shop was consistently producing jewelry every single day. In order to manufacture jewels of high aesthetic and artistic value, the first thing you need is qualified labor. The advantages Cuervo y Sobrino has in this regard is the training of qualified staff to manufacture this type of item, of luxury items. A large part of the production was exported. Not everything remained within the country. Cuba exported plenty of jewels abroad, Cuervo y Sobrinos, and other brands as well. Their fame extended even beyond the Cuban borders. For instance, the brand was known in Central America, in South America, and even in the United States. In the 50s, the Cuban economy made its first steps towards global trade. This was due in large part to the growth of tourism. At the same time, demand increased since tourists represented a huge potential growth of the customer base. The number of tourists traveling here was astounding. They arrived nonstop. For every tourist that left, another entered, all the time. People came from all over the world to spend money here. As such, some employees spoke several languages. In that firm, they spoke English, French, Spanish, and even German. Additionally, they were very knowledgeable. Although not all of them had a background in jewelry, they were capable of distinguishing any kind of stone. This gem is worth this much. This one is fine. This one is not. They were professionals. During that time, Havana was a modern city at the forefront of the times. It was ahead even in terms of technology. Cuervo y Sobrino's clients were people with high purchasing power. And, like they used to say, they were the high society. Such were the clients who came here, in addition to famous artists. I think the Cuban society attracted them. This open society where they felt good and at ease. Maria Felix was here, so the film made a necklace for her and she bought it. Menin Bojones came here and made purchases as well. She was a very famous TV actress of that era who used to buy here as well. And of course, these values, 
enabled Cuervo y Sobrinos to thrive and evolve, to become the brand we know today. The success of Cuervo y Sobrinos in a highly competitive market was quite a privilege. In 1952, there were 11 jewelries in San Rafael Street alone, and by 1957, that number had increased to 13. Cuervo y Sobrinos has a historical identity. It is a Swiss luxury watch brand, born in a Caribbean island. Those people who intended to buy a watch would visit Cuervo y Sobrinos. The name Cuervo y Sobrinos alone is loved by people. It was the company's. That small logo, written in italic, had a great significance. That would bolster sales. Obviously, customers were buying high-quality watches. This is not just any watch. I think that is crucial to the jewelry store's success. It's what allowed the company to dominate its niche, as well as capture a larger market share, and especially maintain it, which is the most important thing in this line of business. During its golden years, Cuervo y Sobrinos was one of the most important jewelry brands in Latin America. It left a brand for posterity and marked an evolution of the watch industry in Cuba. I mean, there had never been a jewelry store so famous, and which is still remembered even today, despite all the years that went by. January 1st, 1959 marks the beginning of far-reaching changes in Cuba. The change was rather gradual, so the company was still operating as usual in 1959. As a result, the product quality started to decline. Now the company had to work with semi-precious stones. They used aquamarine, amethyst, and avidurine, so the products they made was different. What happened next? was the total separation from the workshop. The workshop produced for Cuervo Sobrinos, but also for everyone else. They prohibited working with gold and started using silver. And then Soviet watches arrived. They started selling suits and silver jewelry. So the jewelry business started declining. Ricardo Ravon left Cuba with his entire family and never went back to the jewelry industry. Some individuals came to our store. They sealed the safe box, confiscated the stock, including what was displayed on the table. They took away all the tools we use, gave us a little piece of paper, and put us on the street. That's right, on the street. To me, the art of jewelry making is life. Life itself. When they shut down the store, I cried. I got sick. I even got rashes. They told me it was uh, caused by the shock. It seems that no one claimed Cuervo y Sobrinos. It expired, disappeared. Therefore, it was no longer a brand. During the 90s, Cuba entered a deep economic crisis and started once again opening up to the rest of the world. An Italian antique dealer named Luca Musumesi learned about the story of the Cuban jewelry, re-registered the Cuervo y Sobrinos trademark in 1999, and relaunched it in Europe with the distributor Marzio Villa as a luxury watch brand. The headquarters of Cuervo y Sobrinos is situated in the south of Switzerland, on the short of the Lugano Lake. Of course, we are not uh, in the Caribbean, but, but uh, this part of, of the country is, is very Mediterranean. So the first step in the creation of a product is obviously uh, to first define the need uh, of the product. Why do we need this? 
uh, what do we need, which are the new products or the new references that we need to integrate in our collection. Once this is done, uh, the, the most important uh, and, and sometimes also challenging uh, process and step is to create the story behind the watch. For us, uh, it is crucial to always have an authentic story behind the product that is linked to the Cubania, that is linked to this Latin uh, world, which is the, the main drive of our uh, brand. The, the story can be linked to the past, to the history, can be linked to the present, to the future, to the product, but has to be authentic and consistent with our world. That's, that's very important, that's what makes us and our brand uh, different from all other uh, brands in, in the world. So we, we always say that uh, each uh, watch has a story to tell and each great story inspires a great watch. Cuervo Sobrinos was born on a Caribbean island and is the only luxury watch brand dedicated to the Latin world and the Latin uh, culture. The philosophy of Cuervo y Sobrinos is somehow inspired by the past. In fact, when we uh, relaunched the brand at the beginning of the year 2000, we didn't want to create a new brand. Uh, we wanted to capitalize on the uh, Latin roots and uh, on the DNA of the uh, brand from the past. However, it is logical that we also need to, to innovate the product, uh, to have products that are on track in terms of uh, new technologies, uh, new materials, of course, also the design of the watches uh, has been adapted to the today uh, and future taste. Today the watches are created in Switzerland, of course, uh, in south of Switzerland and more precisely in Capolago on the shore of the lake of Lugano. But we still have a shop in the Havana Vieja, in the center of Havana, as, of course, a witness of the tradition and the past of the brand. Yes, Cuervo Sobrinos is a, is, a, is a brand with a long uh, tradition. We are uh, approaching the 140 years. Next year we will have our 140 years anniversary. Uh, this is a, an important achievement and of course for this important uh, target we are preparing some uh, amazing new project. Uh, it's uh, an important milestone uh, within our, our history. With my watch, I am not just selling a device to measure time. I am selling the symbol of a tradition. I am selling the symbol of a country. I am selling Cubanness.